Thanks, Minister. My question uh, relates to the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, and I acknowledge that you have introduced some changes that will lead to some modest uh, uh, improvements in pricing. But the Grattan Institute's produced a number of reports over the last couple of years that have um, highlighted that compared to other nations like New Zealand, Britain, Germany, we pay far more uh, through the PBS, taxpayers pay far more through the PBS, uh, multiples of uh, the, for so, the same drugs in other jurisdictions. Um, they've suggested that Western Australia adopt the New Zealand, uh, Australia adopt the New Zealand model of Pharmac, whereby they have a single agency that has a fixed budget that goes and then negotiates with the drug companies uh, for the best price deal that they, that they can get. Uh, they demonstrated that uh, prices in New Zealand for the most commonly bought drugs are uh, via their scheme is a, is a sixth the price in Australia. I guess my question is why wouldn't we replicate, as the Grattan Institute has su suggested, uh, that model uh, and get uh, uh, pay less for our, our pharmaceuticals? Uh, thanks for the question. I didn't get where you're from, if that's all oh, right. Sorry, I'm ask. from the Health Consumers Council of Western Australia. Good. Well, I'm very pleased to meet the consumers here at this forum. Um, I don't agree with all of the conclusions that the Grattan Institute has made in that or all of their reports, but they're a sound organisation and I read their findings with interest. Yes, it is true that Pharmac, the New Zealand system, is in many cases less expensive than Australia. But if you're a consumer, uh, if you're a patient in New Zealand with MS, the latest treatment is a drug called Lemtrada, which you probably pr are prescribed in, in a third line treatment sense. Um, the New Zealand system doesn't put that drug on the PBS, so patients come to Australia. If you have advanced Parkinson's disease and you need deep brain stimulation in New Zealand, the New Zealand PBS will not support you, so you come to Australia. If you need some of the uh, treatments that solve severe and chronic pain, and that again involves brain stimulation, you come to Australia. I'm very proud of our system because yes, it's generous, and yes, in probably many respects, it is more expensive, but um, it gives people here access to treatments that they wouldn't receive elsewhere in the world. Um, my department does actually, as I'm sure you know, undergo a, you know, a very vigorous series of agreements with the manufacturers of medicines post the listing announcements and those negotiations you know naturally are in confidence and I'm not across the detail of them nor should I be but what I do know is that the asking price for medicines and the final listing price are often substantially different and that we are able to uh, make the necessary changes to the prices of drugs depending on new listings that come on the market and, uh, you know, competitors that move in and also the move from innovator to generic. So, um, uh, yes, it's terrific to keep the focus on affordability, but um, I'm very defensive of our system. Thank you. Um, you talked about the federal-state relations aspect, um, and, of course, in health, I mean, as we know, in the previous government, there was talk about... Um, you know, the, the federal government taking over the hospital system uh, unless the states could get their act together and uh, these things could work. And this is often the complaint about uh, the complexity of the system. Hmm. I mean, I know the, uh, the premiers are meeting in a few weeks' time with the Prime Minister, but where does, where does the, the, the dividing line work? Is it, is it a system where you, if you had one provider or one purchaser, hmm. the system would suddenly become a lot cheaper or, or, or more efficient, or you know, are we just stuck with what we've got? Hmm. Well, I think... Um Jonathan, we all agree that the system is clumsy and inefficient. And one of the reasons for that is the two accounting streams of uh, federal and state government, which mean that naturally um, each level of government acts to, you know, keep the costs as low as possible in their own sphere of influence uh, at the expense of the other level of government where the overall cost per patient continues to increase. There's a real opportunity as we lead into the next Commonwealth State Health Agreement, the current one expands in two expires in 2017-18, to do something different. And I know that the Prime Minister is very interested in real reform in this area, as am I. There's a lot of argy-bargy politically between um, state and federal governments. Look, there always will be, and health and education are always the number one and two areas of, of that sort of debate. But 
what I say to state health ministers when we sit around a table, and we're doing that quite soon in August, is, what I say is, look, let's have the political bun fight because that's what we do. But when we sit down here, let's work on options that make a difference. And if we can, between us, determine how we might fund this ever-growing group of patients with chronic and complex conditions, in a way that keeps them out of hospital, that avoids the $7 billion a year uh, cost to the Australian economy in avoidable hospital admissions. Um, you state government's looking after your budgets, we're looking after our budget, but most importantly, the patient is better off. So um, I'm quite excited by those opportunities, and I know that my state health ministers, it's, um, wherever they are in Australia, are really interested in having that constructive conversation. Uh, Sue Fai from Curtin. I was interested in your comment about, about prevention, having a public health background. I'm thrilled to hear you say that. And, um, and yet we, we, we often say that we, we talk about prevention, primary health, and yet we are looking at an increased incidence and prevalence of those chronic diseases that you talked about. And you also talked about the fee-for-service model not really supporting prevention, and I totally agree with you. You did say that there was a review, but what do you think? What are your thoughts about how do we change a model that is not set up to prevent chronic disease easily? Thank you, Sue, for the question. And we are very challenged by how we can use our public health systems to stop people getting sick in the first place or to catch them before they become too sick or, uh, very importantly, with you know, the unavoidable increase in chronic disease to manage that chronic disease as best we possibly can. You referred to the Primary Care Advisory Group. That's led by Dr Stephen Hambleton and it has a group of primary care um, providers including allied health and pharmacy and um, psychology, GPs, etc., sitting around the table. And importantly, like my MBS review, this is not the Department of Health, this is not the minister, this is not politicians, this is led by clinicians. So if they don't like it, they'll walk away from it. That's my honesty system. And what I want them to come back to me with is recommendations for a model that does better than the current one. And if you look at a starting place, if you look at the revenue streams that come into general practice, obviously Medicare, uh, practice incentive payments, chronic disease management items, team care plans, funding for, for example, a mental health nurse and so on. Um, how would you better configure all of that to look after a group of, let's say, enrolled patients who see their usual doctor, <clears throat> and if that, not their usual doctor, their usual medical practice, and are coordinated in a follow-up sense? And I think that, that we can do a lot better than we're doing now because, as you know, somebody goes to their doctor, they get diagnosed with, you know, they, they have the, the barrage of tests, your blood sugar's high, you've got early or recent onset type 2 diabetes, they don't feel any different, they go home, they do what they've always done, they make no changes to their diet and lifestyle. As health professionals, you all know what uh, future awaits them in about 10 years and after that they'll probably be considerably unwell and possibly even have advanced to having to take insulin. So um, nobody necessarily in modern medical practices calls them up and says come back, see this person, this person, this person, you don't have to see the GP, uh, and works with them to manage those changes that they need to make. So um, I'm very focused on that. Preventative health is just so important. Um, I don't know if any of you recall the front page of The Australian a couple of weeks ago. I know the individual who was on the front page, John Ross, their higher education writer, because with my previous hat on, I met him many times, about the same age as me, very fit, lived in, lives in Coogee, gone down for a swim and a run, came back, was driving his car around the roundabout, very slowly, thankfully, had a heart attack. You know, that build up of soft plaque in the artery, no one can detect it, no one can feel it. Um, the car rolled on its side. Uh, walking past was a pregnant woman, a nurse, and an older gentleman, I think. And the, it was a lovely picture because um, they were all lined up there and the headline was, you know, saved by the kindness of passing strangers. And they saved his life. But he nearly didn't survive. So my question to, you know, my rhetorical question, I suppose, to the health system is what can we do to 
have that investigation. Because as you know, at the moment, if you go in perfectly healthy, uh, Medicare doesn't pay for the diagnostic process by which you, know, you can be investigated. Doctors are quite able to get around it, so, um, uh, which is a good thing, I think, if you've got a family history of heart disease. But still, you know, what could we do? And one of the things I'm trying to do is do more and more screening We've upped our breast cancer screening, our bowel cancer screening. Um, changes to pap smear mean less gynaecological cancers, I hope, and so on. So um, all of your ideas are very welcome. Yes, thanks very much, Minister, for coming over here and addressing us. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, from birth through our whole lives, uh, we're assisted by the health department, the medical profession and so forth. Do you feel that <clears throat> where people are coming to the end of their life, there should be more emphasis put on assisting people to pass out of this world? Uh, yes, I do. Um, my mother was a palliative care nurse, so I grew up in a home where death and dying was talked about quite normally, which is a you know, young person I thought was quite creepy. But looking back, um, I realised it was eminently sensible. and. As you know, if you uh, talk to anyone who works, who works now with people in aged care, palliative care, uh, they say it's a privilege to be with a patient as they die. Um, we're putting a lot of effort into advanced care directives. It sounds a little bit, you know, evil in war, I know, <laughs> but that's apparently the name. Um, and I think that if we can find a way for within this ma management of you know patients, doctors to say, right, we need to talk about what you want to happen if you're in a situation where you can't answer these questions yourself, what you want your family to do. Because as you know, the decisions haven't been made, the discussion hasn't been had, people find themselves in ICU, um, you know, the family members are under enormous stress, and it's the same argument for organ donation as well. It's not the time to be having the discussion. It needs to have happened earlier. And who better to lead it than your, your doctor in your medical practice? So um, yes, it's the cost of the health system, of course, and we can't ignore that. But um, I also would like to think that for the individuals, they reach a better place spiritually and in terms of themselves than they often do at the moment in what is a very frightening end to life. Mm. Thank you, Minister. Elizabeth Moore from South Metro Mental Health. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is around the um, personal e-health record. I'm glad to know that you've changed it to an opt-out record, but in terms of the health record, now people are only put on what they want to put on. Is that going to be different uh, under the My Health Record? Mm. We are, uh, Elizabeth, we are moving to um, opt out. In the process, we're going to do two significant large-scale trials in two different states and resolve a lot of issues that I don't think have completely been resolved so far. Um, it is control by the person, but I would expect that the record can be... Uh, I mean, at the moment, you can suppress what you don't want to be seen. And we need that there for, uh, you know, we don't want people to feel that control and information of their own health is being taken away from them and provided to who knows where. Um, but that suppression doesn't indicate that, doesn't make the record disappear in that particular instance. I mean, if we're talking about mental health, you can understand that someone doesn't necessarily want everyone to know their mental health history. So, um, you know, we need those caveats in there and how we achieve that while not detracting from the ability for the health record to inform the medical profession is important. And as I said, with these two um, trials, uh, quite possibly one here in WA, um, I think we'll find some answers to how we get that right. At the moment, you, an allied health professional, can't add to the health record. Um, most of the allied health professionals I meet um, don't agree with that, of, and, 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 and a lot of the GPs don't agree with it either. So I think that's a step that we need to take, how we include, uh, you know, without just having sort of masses and masses of guff that isn't particularly meaningful, how we include, you know, allied health information in that record. It's nice to know that there will be another national mental health plan. What's the time frame on mm. that? And is there going to be an evaluation of the fourth national mental health plan? Mm. 
Well, I've appointed an expert reference group led by Kate Carnell, who many of you will know. Uh, Kate has um, strong credibility in the sector because of her work with Beyond Blue and her own personal story. And she said to me, look, I'll, I'll do this for you. Um, but I don't want it to turn into another bureaucratic exercise. I don't want it to produce um, a plan that goes nowhere. Uh, and I don't want it to take too long. And I said, tick all those boxes, Kate. Please uh, lead this work with um, some key people who understand the dysfunction and disorganisation in the mental health system now. By the end of this year, October, I hope, um, I will have you know, the report which will enable me to talk to state governments. We've got to work with state governments because so much of the care is provided in the acute sector and in the community sector. And anyone who's experienced the mental health system will know, as I, did, as I do, um, after reading the report, um, that it isn't really about money, important though money is, you can always add more money. It's very much about just the inability for the sectors, the sections to communicate with each other. So, um, you know, somebody presents, um, they've got to have paperwork done in a, by a caseworker in order to go, for example, into a detox unit, in order to go into a rehab unit. Uh, then they step outside into a mental health field if in fact the alcohol and drugs uh, provider says you need mental health support, so suddenly they disappear into another silo. Uh, then they have to wait for an appointment, and you know the 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 you know the inability of all this to come together is enormously frustrating. So, you know, we we have to get that right, um, and I'm I'm really looking forward to it being done in a cohesive sense. Uh, Sarah Carroll from the Faculty of Health Sciences at Curtin. Uh, given the need to improve the efficiency and and cost effectiveness of our health system. Can you talk to us about your views on expansion of referral rights and prescribing rights to suitably qualified uh, non-medical health practitioners, allied health practitioners, for example? Um, improvements to scope of practice are not really for the Commonwealth to determine, and I know that there are, uh, there are quite a few strong discussions going on between the various professions about who is able to do what. To the extent that there is um, regulation, it's pretty much state government. So um, I, you know, I'm happy to talk to you about it, but um, we don't actually exert much influence from Commonwealth level on those things. But um, we do hear from a lot of different groups about their um, views on being able to, for example, prescribe medications when their profession can do that in another country, but not here. So interested to to talk further. We also have. Uh the Ministry for Sport as part of your portfolios. Uh, can you comment on the interplay between your sport and health portfolios and also specifically about the effects of drugs and alcohol in sport and its effect on health generally? Thank you. Um, thank you. It's great to get a, a question on sport. Um, and the sports portfolio now lives with health. It's got a very powerful big brother in health because sport didn't used to sit at the cabinet table, it used to sit with the arts portfolio outside cabinet. And when our friends in finance and treasury wanted money, they often, <laughs> they often tackled those areas. And by the way, sport and arts never got on very well together. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, so I'm delighted that sport sits where it needs to in health. And we have a very, very strong participation agenda, as well as the um, funding that we give our elite athletes through the AIS, and particularly the athletes themselves in the lead up to Rio, we're 5th of August, one year to go. Um, but it's not all about becoming an elite sports person, and that's not the message we would ever want to give to children. We do know that one out of four children is obese or overweight, and we do know that 77% of children don't really do any exercise at all but sit on the couch. So our Sporting Schools initiative, you can all look at it at sportingschools.gov.au, which I'm actually launching uh, in Sydney on Monday, is $100 million over two and a half years with grants to either primary schools, to um, sporting clubs or to coaches to um, get this actually happening. And we know that if you learn a sport when you're young, even if it falls away in your later adolescent years, uh, you can always come back to it and it's important for your social and emotional development. Um, in terms of drugs in sport, the integrity in sport um, agenda from the federal government is uh, 
I'm not saying it's not about alcohol and um, illicit drugs, but it's very much about um, doping in sport and integrity in sport and having clean athletes competing in a clean professional environment. So um, you know, we commit funding to uh, ASADA, which carries out the work that we know needs to happen as we are linked to an international code on anti-doping. In fact, Australia was a founding member of WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association, um, and we take that work very seriously. And, you know, we get a lot of flack for it because people generally don't like to think that athletes do the wrong thing, and, um, and sometimes they don't. But there is a level of performance enhancing drug that is actually um, not allowed in participating in, in, in professional sports these days. I've been personally very disappointed to read of the examples of um, sporting individuals and teams involved in cocaine use, in excessive alcohol binges and so on. Um, while those are a matter generally for law enforcement, um, the more we can do to encourage those sports people to remember that they're role models to so many young Australians, um, uh, the better we will be. And I think that the when, when those when those issues hit the hit the media, um, the shame and distress that the individual individuals and teams experience, which I know about, uh, is uh, can I tell you a massive disincentive. John Mamo, Faculty of Health Sciences, Curtin University, um, underpinning. Preventative and primary health care is a robust research community and Australia, of course, boasts proudly in, in that domain. Um, the human papilloma virus and Helicobacter pylori are two great examples. Um, but presently, the NHMRC, which is our core funding body for health and medical research, is faced with uh, extraordinary pressures with the number of high quality applications that are coming through. And it's anticipated that we might see a success rate as low as well, single digit figures, single digit figures this year. Um, could you provide some commentary on how you might see health and medical research um, continually being supported in a very complex and competitive environment? Well, thank you, John. And that low uh, success rate that you speak about shouldn't obscure the fact that the annual funding through NHMRC is close to $800 million. It was actually under Tony Abbott when he was health minister that we saw a ramping up, a significant ramping up on um, expenditure on government expenditure on medical research. And while the uh, budgetary situation between now and then hasn't allowed us to continue that increase, it's still relatively high, uh, in spite of the fact that the previous government tried to take quite a bit of money out of medical research. Um, it's actually been put to me by, by the, the organisations um, that the fact that they put in so many applications works against them and comes up with that low success rate and maybe they should be only able to put in fewer applications and you know, I, think, I think that's an interesting way of looking at it. But there's no doubt the space is very highly contested. Uh, we're incredibly committed to medical research, our Medical Research Future Fund, which I hope will see the light of day later this year, unfortunately because the Labor Party sent it off to a Senate inquiry and moved substantial amendments to it and in fact didn't support what we put forward in the lower house, has slowed up the development of this very important um, organisation. And, you know, I, I, see, I see NHMRC as sponsoring curiosity-driven, ground-up research and I see the MRFF, our Medical Research Future Fund, with an ability to take a more strategic focus and look at things differently. I don't think every dollar of medical research spending should go through NHMRC. Um, that was the slight disagreement that I had with the opposition who seemed to think that everything should just be moved over there. Um, the reality is that the MRFF, once established, will take its strategic direction from the chief scientist, and that's a process we already have in place with much more research, other than just medical, across the board. And, um, you know, I think that's a good thing. I hope that those interested in this, including perhaps your group, has put an, uh, a submission into the Senate inquiry. I'm, you know, I'm a little bit anxious that that Senate inquiry, which is happening very soon, the hearings will be happening soon, will come up with um, an unusual conclusion that means that, you know, for some reason the MRFF doesn't actually get up when we need it to. But anyway, I'm an optimist and I'm very hopeful that it will. Mm -hmm. 
I should just add that the uh, one of the things I want to see the MRF do, and we all know we need, is the translation and commercialisation of the projects that come through the research. So it would also have much more of a focus uh, than, the, than most of the NHMRC projects. You talk about obesity and you know, issues with young people, so what's, what's the, the latest uh, state of play for like with advertising of fast foods, junk foods mm. and, uh, and pricing also of um, you know, soft drinks etc. Is there any movement there? Look, I I wouldn't uh, attend uh, an event where someone doesn't raise the need for something like a fast food tax, a sugar tax and so on, um, and I understand exactly where they're coming from. As Liberals, we, we don't believe in a, an approach that's over-regulatory, and I support that philosophical view. But more importantly, I actually don't think these things would work very well. I think it's quite simplistic to say, um, if you don't see the advertising or if the price goes up, um, a certain behaviour won't happen. I think that very much these um, products are answering a demand in the community and by not advertising them or by making them more expensive, I don't know how effectively you reduce the demand. Um, I do know uh, from my work in my previous portfolio as Minister for Childcare that so much is determined about a person's um, proclivities, intentions, behaviour in the early years that the more we can do in the naught to four, uh, the Jesuits used to say, give me a child until they're seven, but I actually think naught to four, uh, the more we can do in those years, the more we can set... Um, future adults up for making the right choices and building the right levels of resilience. And it's just so very, very difficult to intervene with anyone um, in those later years. So um, a challenge, um, I agree. I actually met an obesity specialist recently who said by, by the time, uh, some, some, some leading research, by the time a child can reach the fridge door, it's actually too, almost too late. The settings have been formed in utero and in that first year of life and obviously come from the mother that make that um, most, that, you know, obesity a most likely future for them. So it really does give us a very strong message about it's not very easy to change behaviour. Minister, hi. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for um, taking questions. Uh, Marcus Tans, my name. I'm a GP and I'm one of the directors at the uh, newly established uh, West Australian uh, Primary Health Alliance who are responsible for the uh, primary health networks here in WA. Um, in your address, you actually alluded to the fact that uh, you know, the, the primary health networks have evolved from the Medicare locals and, and previous to them, the, uh, the GP networks and the divisions of general practice. Um, as much as you can say, you know, I, think, uh, it, you, I think you understand that uh, it takes a long time for some of these organisations to take, take hold and establish and develop the reputation and credibility that requires them to do their, their jobs, particularly in coordinating primary care, as fragmented as it is, and establishing a relationship with groups like state health and so on. Um, I'm keen to understand whether there's some sort of bipartisan um, arrangement with um, in, you know, the, the opposition around um, the, the continued support for these sorts of organisations to allow them to you know, optimise uh, the value that uh, has been invested in them um, and uh, whether you've got any views on that. I think, Marcus, you're expressing the frustration of you know, a change of government and then a whole lot of um, things happen and um, what does it really mean? I, I, I understand that frustration and... Um, the changes that we made from Medicare Locals to Primary Health Networks are certainly um, substantial ones. The main one being that we found, looking at the Medicare Locals, that 40% of their money was spent on administration and um, that's really way too high. I suppose my general principle about the health dollar is the closer it is to the patient, the better, the more effective it will be. Um, and the key difference, uh, you, Marcus, of course, you know this well, and I must say that the Primary Health Alliance has got off to a great start here in WA. I look forward to good things. Um, the key difference was that the Medicare locals provided services under their own, um, you know, their own brand. So I don't want a brand and I don't want Medi uh, primary health networks to be providing the services. I want them to use the existing professionals, whether it be general practice, allied health or the hospital, in the area that they're responsible for to facilitate, to collaborate and to, you know, give effect to um, actions that improve people's health. This is not about a long, detailed process, so um, a bit of tension with my bureaucrats because I said, look, I don't want the contract to have a lot of process in it. I want it to say, these are the outcomes. These will demonstrate improvements in health. I will be able to say to taxpayers, you know, governments have no money. I will be able to say to my 
stakeholders, you know, my key investors who are the taxpayers of Australia, your almost $900 million over three years is going to improve the health of populations and this is how it's been done. So back to your question, the if there is a change of government, what I suspect they might do uh, is not necessarily dismantle the network but say we have a different set of priorities. I mean, I think they should keep the same priorities, but those priorities may change. They will be about preventative health, about avoidable hospital admissions, about keeping older Australians healthier and happier in their homes, aged care, and the provision of, of, of um, primary care in aged care is an area that I'm quite concerned about. Um, I've also given them a key target of um, intervening early with child and adolescent mental health, and preventative health in terms of you know, immunisations and screening. So I don't think any, I mean, they're, they're pretty bipartisan targets. But if, for example, they wanted to take a particular approach and, you know, the, the, the network is effectively there. And I think that's, I think that's a, that makes sense because the transition has been expensive. I acknowledge that, but it's been a necessary one. Thank you, Minister. Margot Brewer from Curtin University. Um, I noted when you started talking to us today, you started with the rural workforce, which we know is a massive issue. And I guess I wanted to address the future rural workforce, which is our students. And one of the issues that we have, um, well, one of the things we know is students, if they have a placement in their final year, are more likely to seek employment in, in a rural environment. But we have no sustained funding source to support students' uh, costs of travel and accommodation mm -hmm. into rural settings. But we would love to, and the students would love to go into rural settings. We have had some funding from the federal government for the clinical training fund, but for example, this year, out of the $1.5 million we got at Curtin University, there was a $25,000 allowance for all of our students to support them going into rural, remote or into indigenous or aged care facilities. Mm -hmm. And it's just nowhere near what we need. So I'm really interested to know if the Commonwealth government, in looking at the rural workforce, is considering students um, and support for their travel accommodation so that we can provide them with quality rural placements that will assist with the future workforce. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Margot, and I know that you're pointing to the challenges of distance and training and support for students. Um, the challenges we face in government are that we are running budget deficits, not budget surpluses. Uh, in spite of that, I know I've recently signed off, I think, about $480 million to the Rural Clinical Schools and the University Departments of Rural Health indexed over the next three years. So I've been very pleased to be able to do that. There is a multitude of funding streams and supports for rural and regional training, and I am uh, looking at ways that we can streamline more effectively the government spend. I can't unfortunately increase it, but um, uh, it is a very significant investment. Talking to doctors yesterday, um, more, uh, I, I've become quite interested in finding ways where we work with the state government about the intern year, which as you know is provided for generally by the state, but which the Commonwealth can support and also working with the colleges so that we get the uh, perhaps GP registrars or specialist training positions in some of our key regional hospitals. With the infrastructure we've got there in the rural clinical schools, I think we could support um, a more diverse and um, uh, sustainable model for students. The students I spoke to yesterday said what they wanted more than anything, and cost wasn't really what they raised, was the ability, for example, to spend the intern year and then to have something to follow on to. So to make that big change, um, you know, there's quite a bit happening as you are in your final years of, of, of study and then those first couple of years, then there's a gap uh, and then your life might have gone in a different direction and you're back in the city. So um, how do we keep you there in those um, uh, middle junior years, if I can put it like that? And um, I'm looking at some constructive ideas where 
we need, um, you know, we need the training support. So we need the, the registrars and the specialists to commit to this as well. And um, I hope we can do this, particularly in light of the new Curtin Medical School. Um, good morning, Minister. Robin Lawrence, South Metro Area Health Service. Um, my question actually relates to the primary health care networks and the pharmacy p packages that you mentioned. So 900 million over three years for the primary health care networks and the 1.2 roughly for pharmacy. And I'm just wondering if we're advocating for interdisciplinary primary care, why we've got those two separate packages and why they haven't been combined as one so that the pharmacists were more integrally linked with the primary health care networks along with the other allied health disciplines. Um, well, I don't want you to misunderstand. The $900 million we're giving to primary health networks is actually their operational funding to support the work that they do, and that includes a range of, of different activities. Um, the money under the pharmacy agreement is for pharmacy to come back to government with innovative ideas about how they might partner with the um, primary care providers in their area. So. Um, uh, you know, I didn't propose to give that money to the primary health networks, um, but there's no reason why those programs couldn't link with existing work or couldn't include uh, participants within the primary health networks, but they don't need to. So, um, you know, the last thing I, we, we, we want to be doing here is saying, well, this is what it looks like, now go away and do it. Uh, I look forward to pharmacy partnering with, for example, aged care, perhaps the Aboriginal Control Community Health Organisations, and, as I said, with GPs at the centre, and saying, for our community, this is how we see a, a gap. Uh, medicine management, uh, somebody leaving hospital, somebody from a non-English speaking background, you know, needing an extra, extra support and so on. And this is what we want to do with it. So, um, look, I'm pleased that there's significant funding in this space. The key thing about the pharmacy funding is it's going to go through MSAC, Medical Services Advisory Committee, which will tick it off as being evidence-based. So too often we've seen programs where this looks like a good thing, out goes the money, the program ends, nothing really changes, uh, although people still want, you know, the program to continue. I'm not suggesting that. This is about embedding the primary care actions of pharmacy in an ongoing model um, that gets, as I said, approval through um, MSAC and, and therefore sort of permanency, um, which will be a good thing. With the prevention side, um, often uh, health gets overcome by the savagery of dealing with uh, chronic disease and everything that goes with that. Certainly in the, uh, the sport area, uh, there's such a... Uh, a profile on the, the high level sport, the, the, uh, the top end of sport. We're, we're perhaps uh, in the prevention area, which becomes sometimes a confused manuscript because so many people are, are keen to, to uh, pursue healthy lifestyles and um, promote those. Where do you think perhaps uh, the best spends are in you know, health and sport when we're looking to, to have a framework and when people are seeking advice? to ensure that the spends in, in those portfolios and others, are, there's a good pathway that people can, uh, can actually pursue and get our young people and others to, uh, to do that because there are so many well-meaning um, areas, but as I said, sometimes in health it gets overwhelmed by uh, you know, th those other issues and, and sport often gets a focus for all the reasons we know uh, when there are other great opportunities. Mm. Well, thanks, Ron. And, um we certainly are not overlooking the importance of spending our Commonwealth investment on participation that is unrelated to elite sports. So the sporting schools program that I mentioned, which could in fact be in every single primary school and some high schools, is, um, is a real investment by us. It's, it's $100 million over two and a half years. And it means any community club or school can get involved. So I think the key here is to support our community sports facilities, and I don't necessarily mean infrastructure, even though I know every, every club would like improved infrastructure, and from time to time both state and federal governments provide those programs and that funding. But um, by bringing in the, the club, um, we bring in the community. And rather than government having an endless stream of money to support these things, the importance is to build the capability in those communities through programs like sporting schools, because it's not just inside the school gate, um, so that the person links with that and understands that it's there for them over a lifetime. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not easy. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't link, by the way, 
um, activity with diet. I think they're two separate things. I think educating people about activity is one thing and educating people about diet is a completely different thing. And I think that is vital as well. And that needs to happen in early childhood for all the reasons that I've mentioned earlier.